Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to EdChat Interactive. It's uh, just about 8 o'clock, so I figured we might as well get started now since uh, a number of you are, are here already. I didn't want to make you wait. Uh, tonight, uh, we're talking about uh, education technology and early learning uh, with Gail Lovely. Um, Gail and I have been talking over the last week, and this should be a really interesting session for all of you. Um, for those of you who are new, uh, and even for those of you who aren't new, I'm going to go spend a, a couple minutes just talking about EdChat Interactive and the Shindig platform, which is what we're using. Um, you should know, if you've been here before, that our purpose in providing EdChat Interactive is to allow educators to share best practices, but in a format that's more in tune with the way adults learn than what a typical webinar is. So we would like you to be very interactive in this session. Uh, Gail's going to have times where she's going to ask you to form small groups and discuss problems. Uh, we're going to ask people to come up stage and talk about what they're doing in their classrooms or some of the difficulties that they encounter or some of the software or tools, ed tech tools that they use. So we'd like you to interact, reflect, participate, and learn in this session. Now, the reason we can do this is because we're using a package called Shindig, which allows for a degree of interactivity that I haven't seen in another um, webinar type platform. Uh, the first two ways of interacting are with the raise hand button and the ask button, which are underneath your avatars. Uh, the raise hand button, uh, is something that's visible to me. Um, it's it's a way of me knowing where you are and that you that you'd like to talk to me. So at times we're going to say, would anybody like to discuss uh, an issue with Gail? And if you'd like to discuss an issue with Gail, you're going to click that raise hand button, and then I'll uh, I'll bring you up stage and you can have a discussion with Gail. Uh, the second way of interacting is with the ask button. The ask button is a way for you to ask questions. The question then goes to me, and then I pass it on to Gail, and uh, she can answer it. If you have a technical question, you can also ask it. And if any of you are on tablets, the Ask button is a way for you to interact with me. That's really the only form of interaction that you have if you're using a tablet is with that Ask button. So that's primarily used to ask questions, and then I forward the questions on to Gail. Then the third way of interacting, and I think a number of you are doing this right now, is through IMs or chats. Now, I'm the only one who doesn't see any of the IMs, so you could say whatever you want to about me, and I won't see it. Uh, if, um, if you want to talk with your chat or text with the other people who are here, if you hover over your avatar, you'll see that there's, there's a five-item menu, and one of those items is called IM. If you click on that IM, you'll get a dialog box that comes up on your screen, and you can start typing. I'd like to encourage you to do that right now, is to open up that IM window, and uh, why don't you type in where you're from, you know, what's, what state that you're, or city that you're teaching in, and also uh, type in something that you'd like to learn in today's session. Um, and, and that'll give Gail a... a, a a better idea of the th types of things that, that you all want to learn today and starts you learning a little bit more about Shindig and the way Shindig works. So those are the first three ways, is uh, raising your hand, uh, clicking the Ask button, opening up the IOM window by talking, and then a fourth way is to interact directly with other participants. Now, generally at this time, we we have you do an exercise like this where you'll click on the avatar of somebody else and discuss a question. Like you can introduce yourself, you can talk about um, how do you find technology resources to use in your school or class, or what or what technology resources you use with early learning learners. Um, but I think that tonight, because Gail has so much information that she wants to go through, and she's going to be doing this a couple times, instead of doing this right now, um, we'll 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 skip this for now, and we'll do we'll give you a chance to do this while um, while Gail poses questions to you. Now, Gail is a featured speaker at the FETC conference, the Future of Education Technology Conference, which will be in Orlando, Florida. Uh, you can see it here, uh, January twenty fourth to January twenty seventh. This is really the winter conference to go to to find out what's happening in ed tech. And I think, actually, I have the wrong code there. I forgot to change it. But if you type, if you go and register in the next few days and use the, the code 
EDCHAT6, you'll get a $30 reduction in the price uh, to register for FETC. So I'd like to encourage you to go to Florida is, is a nice place in uh, nice place to be in January. Uh, certainly a lot nicer than some of our colder states up north. Um, and at the same time, you'll be interacting with other educators, uh, CTOs, CIOs, um, special ed pupil services directors, and having a chance to, to learn a great deal about how education technology is improving education today. So I uh, do want to mention our next two ed chats coming up. Uh, next week, we're having uh, Luis Perez, who's going to be here, and he's going to be talking about uh, uh, some of the principles of universal design and how we as educators can use those principles to, uh, to accommodate differences in all of us. And then on December 21st, uh, we're going to have Tracy Weeks. She runs the State Ed Tech Directors Association, and they're working with states and large districts to uh, come up with standards on how to find and evaluate great digital materials. And so she's going to be going over how you all can tap into the resources that CETA and the different states are, are, are doing. That should also, that is, uh, Luis and Tracy are also both speaking at FETC, and this will give you a good prelude and a chance to interact with them. So that's what's coming up. But what's coming up right now is Gail Lovely. So um, I'm not going to read uh, the information on the bottom here, but it's large enough so that you can take a look at it. Um, I would encourage your, you to, to take a look at her book, Suddenly Clicks. Um, it's, it's really a, um, a great way of understanding how education technology uh, can be used, especially iPads can be used with early learners. And let me stop this presentation right now and bring up Gail. Well, welcome to EdChat Interactive. Thanks, Mitch. So you're in Oklahoma right now. Um, can you just, because I was just fascinated, what are you doing in Oklahoma? Well, I'm, I live in the Houston, Texas area, but I'm work, I work every month with a school here in Oklahoma, which is um, in the National Center for uh, Cherokee Indian Tribe. And I work with a school that's a public school that has 85% um, Native children. And we're working on a three literacy project with Cherokee literacy, digital literacy, and traditional Right. sort of traditional literacy hmm. so we're i'm working particularly with the preschool there we have three and four year olds each have their own ipad wow fascinating it's pretty exciting so i'm gonna to pull, yeah so i'm gonna pull myself down and you're in in a hotel so we're gonna keep our fingers crossed that the uh the the, the internet continues to work and i'll pull up your first batch of slides great thanks So I'm glad you're all here. I'm um, honored that you took time from your busy uh, schedules and life to join in and um, have an opportunity to learn and talk and share. I, I really look at this as kind of a, um, a group project, not an independent project. Mitch, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So I know it's important to know a little bit about the person who's sharing. And so I want you to know I'm a real world person. Um, while I'm not in the classroom uh, full time anymore um, as a full time classroom teacher, I'm in classrooms a lot. I do a lot of classroom coaching as a part of my work with my company, Suddenly It Clicks. And I'm not afraid to get down and dirty and doing whatever it takes. And um, so I'm pretty grounded in realities, I understand that learning is messy and technology fails, um, and yet we all still learn. So. Um, I've been at it for a while. Someone recently introduced me as a pioneer. I'm not sure I want to be called a pioneer. It makes me feel old and as if I belong back on the Oregon Trail, perhaps. But um, yes, I've been at this for a while. My passion really is this early learning um, age group and the um, because that's really where it all begins. And we can go to the next slide, Mitch. Uh, everything we do with the little ones uh, is a basis for what happens next. And the reason why we wrote our book, which we wrote for parents, really, was we saw a lot of um, poor choices happening with what technology was doing 
um, with the little ones and that we really felt like we needed to offer parents some guidance before kids ever got to school about using technology um, to a more positive methodologies or more positive outcomes. Uh, we were seeing um, smartphones at first and iPads and tablets more recently being used basically as the most expensive pacifier ever invented. And we felt like there were other choices and things that could happen and that we, maybe we could help uh, parents and schools and teachers along the way. But we know there's some challenges. And let's go to the next slide. And we're going to have a quick conversation. Um, and what I want you to do is try to find someone to pair up with. Or if you don't have a camera, you can use the, the, um, the text window. But the question really is, what do you think are the biggest challenges? What are the things that make it more difficult or impossible or unlikely um, to have success with using tech with young learners with literacy in mind? So Mitch, do you want to explain to them again how to talk to each other? Sure. So this is the time to click on the avatar of another person. Uh, you see them floating around your screen. If you click on the avatar and you both have microphones, you can talk to each other and you can build groups of two, three, or four people and talk about this question, uh, do you think are the biggest challenges to using tech with young learners with literacy in mind? Now, if you don't want to do that, then the, then the next way to interact would be to type into the IM window. And again, if you don't have the IM window open right now, if you move your uh, mouse over your avatar, on, uh, then you'll see a five item menu, click on IM, and then you can type to the other people in the room. So I'll, um, I'll pull myself down. Oh, and I see that there's uh, at least one person with a tablet. Um, for you with the tablet, if you just click on ask, um, then you can um, then you can type something into me and I can share it with everybody else. So I'll pull myself down and we'll come back up in a couple minutes. Well, I saw some discussions there and a, and a number of you got to talk to Gail directly. So uh, Gail, what did what did you find out from people? What were some of the things that they brought up? Well, we're still having some challenges with some of us not being able to hear each other, but that's oh. par for the course on the first try on something from all over the world, so that's not really surprising. A couple of things came up that I think rang true for more than one person, and um, one of those things was about finding the apps Of finding apps that are appropriate and safe and um, curated. Uh, a couple of people mentioned that. I think there were also some mess, some people who talked about um, well whether technology's role is really for the teaching or for the practicing of something. So mm -hmm. or whether you know, what where it in the instructional mm -hmm. the learning cycle, uh, which is, is, I think, another piece. I think all, we would probably almost all agree that. So I'm wondering if anybody would like to come up or if you'd like to talk to somebody specifically uh, to come up about uh, their particular thoughts. Um, if you. That would be that'd be so awesome. And I know that you all have the same problems with your students, Anybody getting them to raise their hands and, and be willing to talk. So, um, so it's fun. It's, 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 it's enjoyable. Uh, just click on the raise hand button and uh, I'll pull you up. Um, darn. So and none of the people that you talked to earlier were um, volunteered to come up while you were talking with them? Yeah. Not yet. OK, well, we'll try again. Okay. All right. Then I'll pull myself I think down. I already took. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll pull myself down and I'll get your slides up. No, I'm not yet, but maybe they'll be braver. We'll go a little bit more and we'll see. That's fine. And we'll go ahead to the next slide and we'll come back. Perfect. Don't don't be afraid, guys. We can we can do this together. It's all part of. We have to model taking risks. We ask kids to take risks every time they do something at school. So it's kind of important for us to do it too. 
You know, when I started, it was really truly a kind of a different time and place because we didn't have the technologies you have now. And the big discussion was, well, do we use tech because it's prep for jobs or prep, prep for something, some tasks? And there was very little talk about tech for learning, for practicing learning, um, because we really, if we had a setup like this young lady um, sitting there, her feet don't reach the ground, her the mouse is bigger than her hand, and we would have to spend quite some time just teaching mouse skills. We were really teaching tech as opposed to teaching to use tech for a different purpose. And then really things started to change. And we can go to the next slide. And what really changed was this whole kind of movement to mobile touch screen, multiple touch screens. You know, the first iPad was only in 2010. It's only six years ago. And I don't even count that one because it didn't have a camera. So for me, the really the first iPad was the iPad 2, and that was 2011. So that's really recent. But that really is when I think everything changed. Now, I, I taught with technology in 1983. <laughs> and, you know, there was nothing that was child designed for children who couldn't read. Um, there were no tools. The, the, the robots were complex. Um, this middle picture here, those children are working with B-bots which are almost directly programmable in the sense of you push the button to say well, it goes right or left, turns right or left or goes forward or backwards. And it does it as soon as you push the go button. It's very direct kind of interaction as opposed to using a mouse or a touchpad or a keyboard. So I think things kind of fundamentally changed when the technology changed and that this is really kind of changed the possibilities um, so that we could focus more on the learning of the, the kinds of things we're more comfortable with literacy and so forth and move a little bit from especially with the very youngest learners about how to use the technology. I know you've seen online there's tons of YouTube videos of kittens and puppies and babies and orangutans using touchscreen tablets with purpose not just because the scene changes but even orangutans ordering their snacks based on the pictures they touch on the screen. This, these are very different tools with very different possibilities. With that being said, there's not a lot of great long-term research because they haven't been available. So let's go to the next slide. There are some things we know. There's an old, old quote about all television is educational television. The question is, what is it teaching? And I think we can certainly say that's probably also true about educational technologies that using tech is going to teach children something but we don't really haven't done a really um, great job of figuring out what all it teaches but i think we're getting closer we used to measure how well kids use technology by how fast they could type or how fast they could keyboard when i was in college it was how many um, punch cards and how long your printout was um, we really haven't quantified all of that so much. But there's some interesting new things out. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, um, this is some, a quote out of a piece of research that came out just this October um, from the Tech Center at Ericsson. And they surveyed a national survey of the US, a thousand parents with children under the age of six. So that's not a huge study. It's interesting that 85% of the parents said they allow their children under the age of six to use technology. And 86% of them said that they saw benefits. And one of those benefits that parents cited was literacy. Um, that's pretty fascinating that the parents are seeing this as a, a tool already that, that maybe even some schools aren't seeing, but parents have great hope at least that that's one of the things of their children's use of technology in the home. Let's go to the next slide. You all mentioned, or several of you mentioned, the, the app and the curation or lack of curation of apps. And this is from some research from last year. So it's a year old, which is a long time, um, but new, really, uh, saying that they looked at app descriptions. And what they did is they took 186 apps that were from the list of the top 50 paid or free apps 
from um, the variety of app stores. Um, they were education, labeled as education, and they also, some of those apps were also from lists of award-winning apps for education. And when they analyzed the descriptions um, of apps that were targeting the under eight-year-old group, there really wasn't any specifics. It didn't really say who it was for, but almost all of them said it was for preschool, which I think is a big red flag. Uh, by the way, almost half of those apps that they found on these top lists were actually on all three marketplaces, the Apple Marketplace, the Google Play Marketplace, and the Amazon Marketplace for apps. That's a huge change, that we're getting to see a few more apps that are going across the board. But I think the bigger message here is really, you make an app, you say, oh, it's good for little kids, so we'll say it's for everything to eight-year-olds. While we can say there are some physical toys that span that age group, like blocks or balls or lots of other things, it's hard to imagine how many apps really spread across that age group. Well, according to this, 90% of the ones that target an age range included preschool, which I think is a little bit telling. It's a little bit interesting to think about is that do they just list it there because they know that's what sells? That's part of the question. I think this speaks to what you were talking about earlier, several of you, about how are things curated and how do we really know? There is no real clearinghouse about what apps are good for whom. And I think that's one of the challenges. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the questions is, what are these educational apps teaching or help having kids practice? What you see most of those are the things that are kind of low-hanging fruit. Names of letters, letter sounds, sight words, uppercase letters and lowercase letters. Those are the things that most of those apps are doing. Nothing wrong with any of those, right? Those are things we teach. Those are things we value. But um, there's so much more to literacy than that. And some of them, by the way, don't fit very well. There are still apps in the App Store that have misspelled words in sight word lists, as an example. There are a lot of free apps that only, they're going to teach you about the vowels, but they only teach A and O. So because they're free, if you want the rest, you have to pay for them. So there's some real challenges there kind of about what's available and what they're doing. But there are some really great ones out there. Too. We'll talk about some of those. Let's go to the next slide. So you might have noticed that I put teaching in air quotes, in quotes. And I think it's kind of important to kind of pause here. And as a group, let's talk to each other and then maybe even put it in the IM or through the ask if you're on a um, tablet. What are the roles for technology and literacy with littles? And by littles, I'm talking eight years and, and younger. What kinds of things, what roles can technology have, specifically in literacy, with this age group? This is another time for you to talk to each other. So um, if you're not able to do that, of course, you can put it into the IM. But if you can, let's spend just a couple minutes um, just to do a quick kind of what's the role for technology with these age kids? Okay, ready to talk to each other? Let's do it. Okay, so you're all experienced now. Uh, click on the avatar of another person with a webcam, if you have one, and, um, and uh, talk about some of the roles that you see technologies can play for uh, early learning. Uh, if you don't uh, have a webcam or you don't feel like doing that, uh, please type in the, the um, the IM box. Uh, again, if you hover over your avatar, if it's not open, hover over your avatar, click on IM, and it'll open up the box, and you can uh, talk to people that way. And we'll be back up in a second. And please, I'm really hoping that this time when we ask somebody to come up, somebody will volunteer, click on that raise hand button, volunteer to come up, and uh, talk about some of the roles with, um, with us. So I'll pull myself down.
Okay, I saw you were in a discussion. Um, you know, I, you, you were mentioning curating before is one of the problems to uncover. And I was wondering, have you, um, what do you think of common the common sense media? Um, they have a, um, you know, they have a website that allows you to screen by age, by whether it's a movie or an app, um, and it's and it's a not for profit. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of biased towards nonprofits. But what what do you think of them? So uh, so a couple okay. of things is mm -hmm. um, just like you can read the New York Times bestseller list and realize of the 10 books that they say are great, mm -hmm. that you only really are interested in one. Um, perhaps it's a sieve, common sense and other tools like that are a sieve to get us so we have only 10 to look at instead of 100 or 1,000. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I think that can provide some guidance. But remember, they don't know my children, my the kids' needs. Um, so it's perhaps a way to get to some, but the mm -hmm. trouble is they can only look at very few apps as well. Right. So uh, the little guys, developers, the small software developers, they don't mm -hmm. stand a chance because they don't have a way to get their things to the forefront for a place like Common Sense or any of the others right. to um, review them because, you know, they mm -hmm. re they review very few. So mm -hmm. that's one of the challenges um, to selecting. Okay, thank you. Uh, so is there that's anybody an one yeah. as well. is there anybody that, that you'd like to bring up? Yeah, and I know Mark and I will talk and Mark will share. Okay. All right. Yeah, so Mark I'm gonna bring like to share what we talked about. bring. Good. So I'll bring Mark up. Wow, well, I even got a countdown to coming on stage. That's uh, impressive. Um, we were just talking a little bit about, um, I guess, sometimes the pressure maybe teachers feel uh -oh. to use. Oh, can you hear me? Is it coming through okay? Oh. Sorry, yes, I, I, I can hear you fine. Um, okay. I'll bring myself down and I'll bring Gail back up. Uh, but I, uh, I just want to make sure that you, you knew, you're, you're coming through fine. Okay, I, yeah, so I could, um, we, we talked about maybe the pressures that people feel use technology and with schools being busy places, um, sometimes people are just, um, and I think I used Gail's phrase of grabbing the low hanging fruit uh, to find ways so they feel they are using, you know, maybe the iPads that have just been purchased for their classroom or whatever devices they're using or their kids might be bringing to class. And, uh, and maybe because they aren't that comfortable with it themselves, um, you know, there, and there is so much out there that they're maybe not um, finding what, what could be the best tools for their students. Um, and just, you know, looking at that, uh, you know, what, whatever's on the top sellers list or, uh, and, not, and maybe not what, what the best thing out there is. And, and uh, I think that's that's kind of what we talked about, Gail. Um, it, uh, yeah. I I was just sharing that last night, just by fluke. My I have a seven-year-old daughter, and she uh, opened up. Um, I think it's Homer. I think is the app, and uh, I'm I'm sure it came off the top of the list at the app store, and she was rifling off some sight words um, that, and she's someone who doesn't always really like doesn't enjoy her home reading um, but she had a lot of fun for a few minutes on her sight words but to look at it that critically I don't know how long that would last and I don't think that it would be um, you know I don't think that it can replace her her home reading by any means Thank you. Uh, Gail, uh, other thoughts? 
Can you? Thanks. Gail, can you hear us? Other thoughts, or do you want your slides back, or you thought you know you want to? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I can. Let's go back to let's go on to the slides, but I want I will reflect a little bit while we get this slide there. Um, I think that one of the challenges, I mean, I think in our discussion, Mark's discussion and mine, one of the things came up and in the text as well, which is we tend to want to, uh, I, and I don't think this is a bad thing, by the way, but we find a technology that works for us or the kids are reacting to, and then we keep that um, close to the vest as a, a a tool that we return to. And I think that that's a good thing. I can't tell you how many schools I've been to where they have an, a tablet or even a desktop where the number of tools for children to use, a number in the you know 25 or 30, know that we necessarily, it's not like a book library of books where we need to have so many necessarily. Um, so that's a conversation. I noticed some of you were sharing in the um, I am the windows that you know, you really like to use them. Um, there's some mention of smart boards or interactive projectors or um, and then some of the things you can do there. Those are great ideas. So let, when I was, you know, I was kind of thinking differently than you all, so it's kind of nice that we have a chance to chat and to learn and to think together about things. I was thinking kind of like, well, when do we bring it in and why and, and to what end? What is it, what is it doing for, for us and our kids? And so one of the roles I was thinking about was kind of supporting uh, the skills or the knowledge they don't quite have yet, or they don't, they don't not going to have for a while. So this screenshot on the slide is from an app called Easy Blogger Junior. And I'm not saying that this is the, the right app for everyone, but this actually is an app that's designed for shared tablets. So that if I only had one iPad, I could still have children blog because this is the interface and they don't have to be great readers or even readers at all to have a blog because they can make a video and that's their video for their blog or they can type if they're literate writing or they can put a photo and talk about their photo and all the text on the screen is read to them if they choose to have it read to them used to set, talk about well kids have things they want to say or things they want to share, and a blog is a great place to put that. But if if you're not literate, if you can't write or you can't read, here's a way for technology to support you in doing something, even though you're not yet able to do it in more typical ways. So that's one of the roles that I think about. What can technology bring to the table for those when kids are missing some or not yet developmentally ready for some of those skills? So that's kind of a reading and writing thing here, but also things like letter formation. You know, when they're not quite constructing letters well, there's some ways that technology can support that or how to pronounce things. I, I tell the story myself all the time. The first when Harry Potter books came out, I was reading them with my children who could read them then as well. They were not young children, but we didn't know Hermione's name was Hermione. It was a name we were unfamiliar with. And as we were reading it for mine, we didn't know how it was really pronounced. And then later in the series, we were traveling and we got the CD version and we found out her name was Hermione. And we, in our heads, she was Hermione. It didn't really matter because it was a proper noun, but you know, it could support um, our correct pronunciation was better supported with the electronic version. Um, and I saw in the text message that Kathy was asking about Easy Blogger Junior and Seesaw. Um, they are different tools. Um, they have similar roles, sort of. Um, in the Easy Blogger, just in, is an interface for Blogger. Blogger is a free tool. It comes from Google. Um, you can have as many blogs linked to the, this app as you want. So you can, children can have their own blogs or the blog. But it's, um, so it, it depends on how you set them up. But that's a good question to wonder about. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. It's another example of kind of this support for skills that are being acquired or knowledge. 
uh, ebook, happens to be Tacky the Penguin, um, and it has kind of embedded vocabulary into the story. As the words are read, there's a picture. Those words pop up again. So in this case, the second penguin's name is Lovely. And this screenshot is of a child's touched the picture of that penguin, and it repeats the word Lovely, and it highlights it in the text on the bottom of the page. So if I, don't, if I touch the iceberg, it says ice, and if I touch the sky, it says sky, and shows the word sky, and, and so on. So it's building that vocabulary in the context, not like go look it up, which my parents told me all the time and I never did, um, but it's actually embedded in the, the story. So if I'm a child who doesn't know those ideas, I'm seeing them embedded in story as opposed to in isolation. There are many, many apps that do that, that really provide that support for kids who need help with the um, context and with the vocabulary from within the story in this case. Let's go to the next slide. This next one is another example. This is the only app I know that does this. And you'll see, if you start at the top left, that's the, the these three, all these images are the same page of this book, which is about ants. The top one, the one on the top left, if you look at the bottom corner of it, you'll see there's a little white slider bar. The reader of the story is in that picture reading it at the simplest level. The middle one is the middle level, and the bottom one is the highest level. So you can see it's adding more words, more content, still related to the same topic. So this is all reader adjusted on the fly. And I've watched children use this app some kids start out at the highest one and realize it's a little bit tricky and they'll go slide backwards and kind of get for some reason they want to know more about these animals these ants some children will start with the simple one kind of understand what that's about and want to know more and slide it up but every page in this book can you can the child can change the reading level as many times as they wish so if you think about that then i could have two children reading this ebook, experiencing this ebook side by side, and it's not changing it, making it more babyish or making it, it's, it's giving a different experience, different level of words, different level of content, different level of sophistication, all student choice. I think that's a pretty good model. I think it has some real possibilities for supporting kids who some have more interest, some have less, you know, Maybe it's enough for me. I don't really care about ants and wondering about how they store food is enough. I don't need any more detail. Maybe I'm someone who's really interested in this and I want to know more. So I have all that, those choices, and it's related to my skills, but it's kind of scaffolded, which I think is a pretty interesting way to kind of support children and kind of where they are, um, their language development and their understanding of the context, content and how interested they are. Let's go ahead to the next slide. In, in this case, there are several apps that do this sort of thing. This is an alphabet book, basically. It happens to be about actions, which I am particularly excited about because most alphabet books are nouns, you know, it's cats and bears, dogs, nothing wrong with that. But this one's about um, verbs. And on the fly, the child can switch from English to Spanish and back again. What's kind of nice about that is, in some alphabet books, if you're looking at swim, you've got there through the letter S. If you then change it to, to Spanish, and you go back to the alphabet, it's still on the letter S, even though Nadav doesn't start with it, just making a back cover and switching back and forth, but still sticking it in the S of the alphabet. This app doesn't do that. If I come to this as under S and go to swim, and then I change it to Spanish, and then I leave this picture, I'll be on N, because N is for nadar. So this is a, a complete translation and switching so that it makes sense. So if I'm a child who's interested in learning,
here learning languages or I come from a an adult on campus who speaks Spanish and got a little boy who didn't speak a single word of English. In addition to Google Translate and some other things that they used, they used this app and some others to help him kind of get started. He happened to be a three-year-old. Um, um, and that really helped. Um, um, Mark, I see you asking about the reading adjustments. OK, Kathy got your question. Thanks. Let's go to the next slide. So that, that, that first role is kind of that support of things they haven't learned yet. Um, I think another big role that we overlook is this kind of amplifier of their strengths. So helping kids harness their strengths to do things that are um, interesting and powerful not just to work on deficits or not yet learned things. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, happens to be a free app. It is one of my favorite. This is an ebook. Um, has the standard choices. It'll read it to me, or I can read it by myself. But it also has a story creator. Now, kind of a word of caution after years of working with ebooks, we have to pay attention to where the interactivity is and what it is. In this case, there's not a whole lot of things to touch and click on the screen. If you remember Grandma and Me, the first ebook for young children, it had hundreds of things you could touch that had nothing or very little to do with the story. It was a great interactive experience, but I never talked to a child who ever finished the story. Thanks. Grandma and me going to the beach. You could touch the mailbox and the cat came out. You could, you know, it was distractions. It was fun, but it wasn't really a literacy tool. Now, this book is very simple. There's only a couple of things to touch on a page and they're related to what's going on in the story. So that's all pretty well done. But what's really interesting is if you look at those two pictures on the right hand side of the slide, that's in the story creator tool where they actually gives them the ability to make their own book or story using in the top frame you're seeing illustrations from the book that the illustrator made placing trees in the hole where Ned is looking for a home and Ned the hedgehogs there but the bottom picture some of the other choices in that story creator are the actual non-fiction photographs of some of those things so that's pretty interesting that children could experience this little story and then build on that with knowledge of the real world with the photographs of those animals. Um, it's kind of an interesting twist on what we could do with a book. It also means it's a strength builder. A child could make their own story with those characters using a story creator. They could make a totally different story using the props and the scenes. They can add text if they're already using text. Or they can record their voice if they're not yet um, writing the words. By the way, the Read to Me also allows you to record your own voice reading the story. I was working with a school recently and they had a parent recorded in a non-written language that she was using at home. So the child could hear the story in that language the words don't change on the page, but the voice does. So a child who speaks another language or knows another language can hear that story. I think that's a decent example of kind of harnessing children's strengths. Let's go to the next slide. One of the few places where we really see, um, well, there's lots of ways that we look at old skills and do them in new ways, this kind of novelty thing. But I think there's some that are a little more than novel. Uh, the one on the right here is Writing Wizard, which is a letter formation or letter construction app, or what we might used to call penmanship, maybe. That's one of the few things that I think um, tablets do better than human beings in some ways. Uh, if I'm in a classroom and I'm teaching kids how to write or form the letters, I'm outnumbered. I can't keep up with them. They're going to start at the bottom. They're going to make their circles backwards. They're going to do all sorts of crazy things. But the tablet doesn't let them do that. 
You always have to start the letters at the top. You have to always do the circles a certain way. All of that is muscle memory is built from repetition and doesn't let them do it wrong. That's kind of cool. It's a new approach, a new way to do it. Um, and in this example, it's a name that you wouldn't find normally. It's something that's ready made, so that's kind of nice too. There are fonts if you're using laptops or desktops that are tracing fonts, and you can put in the kids' names, and they can they can do some things with paper. But I think that's one of the really positive things that come out. The one on the right is a um, app called Dentist Bird. Um, what's interesting about what they're doing there? is the stories being told, the words are on the screen, they're also spoken, and it won't go to the next part of the story until the child makes the action happen, or bird hopped in. And it will just sit there and wait until you understand that you've got to put the bird into the mouth of the crocodile, because that's what the story says happens. So that's an comprehension, right? In the context of the story and taking action based on that. I think it's another good example of kind of one of the roles. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I mentioned already that whole letter construction. Um, Patchamel's first lines is a great example of pre-writers who aren't ready to write form letters, practicing just with strokes and shapes. Um, it's very patient, more patient than I, we will be. You know, they go through a piece of paper tracing something and they're done in 15 seconds and they want another one and another one, and you know we're going through all this. It's a very patient place. And while Peter Rabbit's on the right, it's not necessarily my favorite book, but the reason I have it there is just to remind us that sometimes we get tired of reading the same book over and over again to a child or to class. And here's an opportunity. If a child just gets fixated on a story, there's ways to do that without us getting tired of reading them. Uh, Good Night Moon was a favorite book. I had to read it a billion times to my children. I mean, it would have been nice to have somebody else do it once in a while. So there are some benefits to that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is another example where it's just a new twist on an old task. In this case, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, um, but children would go up and scan a QR code. Scattered all around the class. And then if you look at that iPad on the table, you'll see there's a lowercase l on that. Because he scanned a QR code that opened it magically, this letter L. And his job was to then go back to this paper and find the uppercase matching letter and color it in. That's an old task, matching uppercase and lowercase letters. But this now became an active class task because the technology was driving them to go to all these different places in the room, scan them, come back, color it in, and go find the next one. Um, so that was kind of a different take on kind of an old task. And I think that's that novelty that Mark mentioned with his daughter in the vocabulary words. It's, I think that sometimes thing can really help. Let's go to the next slide. So that novelty continues when we talk about materials and access to things we might not have. The one on the left is a brand new app that came out just in the last few weeks. It's a East African or Indian, I can't even remember where it's from, I'm sorry, um, tale, folk tale, Grandma's Great Gourd. And so it brings in different accents, different culture, different style of um, storytelling. Um, it's really interesting that we might not have in our classroom libraries. That's a positive. The one on the right is a website. What's interesting about Storybird is it's free. When you go there, you choose your child. The child chooses a collection of art from an, an illustrator and then builds the book or the story with, from the illustrations, as opposed to writing a story and then finding pictures or creating pictures to match. I, myself, as a little girl, wanted to write books or stories about horses, but I couldn't draw horses. So I wrote stories about marshmallows because they were square and I could draw square. This is kind of the flip side of that where we give them the art to make a story. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a really unusual one. And uh, Mitch, I don't know if you can show the video for Goldilocks here. Are you able to do that? 
it's a very short video. It's a promotion video, and I apologize for showing you a mini commercial. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Goldilocks. She was clever and brave. Once upon a time, there was a little bear. He was kind. So, so what you saw there was that app tells the story of Goldilocks and Little Bear from two perspectives. And you literally turn the iPad over to change from one perspective to the other. And it picks up each perspective and where you are in the story. So what a clever way to teach perspective, right, and point of view. So literally, you're at the part where they're eating and it's too hot or too cold. And you're seeing Goldilocks do that. And then you turn it over and you're at Little Bear's got pancakes and they're too hot or too cold. So it's a very creative way. And I hope we'll see more things that are a little bit like that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, documenting learning and um, what ideas kids have, I think, is probably the biggest, uh, most exciting thing that I'm beginning to see. So quick story, the little, <clears throat> the picture on the left, there's um, a group of kids, and they had heard the story, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, several times. And now they're on the floor making uh, caterpillars out of pom-poms. They're lining them up. If you look closely in the bottom left-hand corner, there's an iPad on the floor leaning against the, cha the table leg. It's totally breaking the rules. It's a bad thing. So I stood there kind of protecting it. And you can see somebody's foot's about to step on it. I just thought some child had forgotten the rules. Well, come to find out what's really going on here is the little boy who's building his pom-pom caterpillar has set his iPad there to videotape himself building it. Now, we hadn't even shown them how to videotape yet, but he had figured out that he could do that. So when we pulled him aside and asked him about it, he said, well, I'm going to record me doing it so that tomorrow I can remember how I did it and I can try it again. He had just turned four. That's metacognition. That's thinking about and documenting what he's doing. That's collecting his ideas to expand on them later. That's pretty high level stuff. That's really where we want to be. I think that's a pretty um, powerful um, opportunity. I, I am amazed that that's a, a possibility um, in today's, with today's tools. Now, Mitch, I'm obviously running re way long. Are you able to skip ahead? Let's see if he can, because I know it's going to. So um, I can go like slide by slide rapidly, or um, the slides are in different files. Do you want me to pull up one of the other files? Yeah. Yeah, go uh, skip to the next section. Sorry, guys. I knew I overplanned. It's, it's loading. I use lots of images, so it makes the files big. So, so one of the other big ideas to think about, let's just go, there we go, is one of the ways to save and energy and money is to use apps you can use, but it's a reminder. So if we're going to use these tools, we have to support them. Um, and, and I think the way to do that is to think through how they're being used and how we support kids when we're busy doing something else. So this slide is telling you to think about providing, if you're using it at a center or a small group, or they're doing it at their own choice time, providing them with video or images or read us like charts that help them um, be supported and be successful. 
we use a lot of QR codes for websites. We do print <laughs> some things, some charts and things. Um, and let's see if you can, Mitch, can you open up the uh, Twinkle Star PDF? I'm really putting Mitch to the paces now. Thanks, Mitch. So sorry, I didn't see a twinkle star. I saw a story ending, um, Bebot. We did Goldilocks, and then there was one more, but it wasn't oh, twinkle oh. star. So maybe I didn't have that one. So this is just an example of what one of these, what I mean by these kinds of documents to help kids when they are um, in a center or working with technology in a semi-independent or independent way. Um, and look, this document will show show is kind of what that looks like if a child is, or children so upper hands you need to wear helpers hands so that you don't do things to kind of signal who's helping the very And I'm sorry if the rest of you ran out of time. These are the, the big ideas. That we want to use technology to really support kids, support their strengths, and the kids, please. I can't. Okay, I'm back. Okay. So these are the things we want to do with technology. It's not just practice or do novel things, but to use those tools and resources to really help support children in their learning, their abilities, their interests, their strengths, and their weaknesses. Too often we focus just on the weaknesses, but I think technology can focus on the whole child and all of those pieces. Great, next slide. But we have to keep in mind, we know what they need to catch. We can't just stand by and hope they catch it. We have to bring them closer to the fish so they can catch them. So we can't just make it extra stuff. It has to be based on what we know we need to do. Next slide. And one more. So in the end, it's not about the tech or the book or the app. It's really about the child and what we do for them. Uh, I didn't. I hope that you got some things you can use. I don't know um, exactly um, how much if we can go on or if we need to stop because we're over time. I I could go on for days. This is my passion. I've gone a little bit long already. Well, I think this might be uh, a way of segueing. Uh, what are you going to be talking about at FETC? Oh, good point. So um, I am so excited. FETC will have an early learning track. So there'll be uh, more than one room that will be dedicated just to early learning so that there'll be a place. Because FETC, I mean, bring your most comfortable shoes. It's a lot of walking. But we'll have a room that will be all early learning all day um, for um, the, for the conference, and that'll be I'm helping to organize that, which is great. I think I'm doing a session there um, on 
uh, that maybe the number of apps we really need is equal to the age of the child. So four-year-olds only need four apps and five-year-olds only need five apps. And I'll be talking about specific apps and so why you're they're saying, important you're and why you I don't need, need um, I need more than 60 apps. apps. I'm also going to be sharing some of the actual products that students have made. Well, I'm about 62. So, um, yes, well, we probably need a few more because we need like an app to remember our passwords and, you know. Um, and we're also going to, I'm doing a workshop or so on Book Creator, my favorite app. Kathy's asked if there's a way to see all the slides, even the ones we skipped. Is that Yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post all the slides. I'm, I'm going to post all the slides on our website. And uh, you'll be able to get them there. So you, so I'll send you, a, I'll send everybody who registered a link to our website, uh, probably tomorrow or, or certainly by Friday. And when you go to our website, there will be a way to uh, download all the slides. And if you have any questions about them. And, and then the, the, the other question I, I have for you is if people wanted to learn about more apps, can they just go to your website? Right. And if you have questions, talk about all of them. Don't hesitate to me at Gail, Gail Lovely at Suddenly Click. Absolutely. So suddenlyclicks.com is my website. Um, there's some information about our book. Some, there's some, I usually put resources from workshops or or as well so there's a lot of things there you can poke around okay good um so i guess uh FETC, FETC is in about a month and a half so. i really like the way oh. you guys are sharing with each other in the text box great job guys oh, good. <laughs> so um i'll see you in about a month and a half i guess in florida And um, any last thoughts that you want to share with people before we sign off? It's coming soon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gail. Um, th this was. Uh, you know, I really hadn't seen the different types of apps that you could use for young kids. I have a. Um, I have two grand nieces or great nieces whatever they're called um one's uh, five and one's coming up to three so now i have good christmas presents to get them and and their parents so um so thank you and i'm looking forward to attending some of the sessions that that you're going to be leading at fetc and uh, we'll be in touch by email and for everybody oh, else I, there you go oh, you're welcome yeah. And you know, for everybody else, um, I'm hoping uh, that you that you're able to come to some of the other de events in December, and we have a few scheduled already for January as well, and we'll be scheduling some for February coming up. So, um, so Gail, uh, good night, and um, and this is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. Hope to see you all soon. Take care.